Well, hello everyone. And thank you for joining us here at Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters. Welcome to Woods and Waters Q&A. This is our second in a series of chats with leaders in conservation, outdoor recreation, and philanthropy. And we're really excited to have you join us today for a conversation with Roxanne Quimby and Sally Jewell. My name is Andrew Bossi. I'm the Executive Director of Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters. We work with individuals and partner organizations as well as businesses in the National Park Service to advance the incredible landscape known as Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. Friends groups like ours aim to add a margin of excellence for our park that public funds alone cannot achieve. Our members' contributions of time, talent, and treasure fuel our work as we support visitation, improve park infrastructure, and economic and youth programs in the region. I am just getting back from a couple days in Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument where I made a solo trek up to the area that you can see as my background. This area is known as the Lookout, not to be confused with the overlook on the Loop Road, but the Loop Lookout and the north end of the park. While biking and hike, hiking that 16 mile round trip journey, I thought about who else has seen what I was experiencing. I thought about other people biking and hiking to the spot. I thought about the ATVers and the loggers that built the trail used to frequent this area back in the day. I also thought about conservationists like Roxanne Quimby, Sally Jewell, and Percival Baxter, who may have visited this very site. But throughout all of that journey, I kept finding myself thinking about the first human inhabitants of this land, the Wabanaki people, who stewarded these lands since the ice sheets retreated 13,000 years ago. We're about to begin a conversation here today about the relatively recent history of these lands, but I want to acknowledge that what we know today as Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument has been inhabited and stewarded long before us. These are the ancestral lands of the Penobscot and other Wabanaki tribes. As we look out to the horizon of what lies ahead for Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, we here at Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters are learning the full story of this landscape and committed to learning more, including about its first human, human stewards and thinking deeply about how we chart its future with descendants of those original stewards today. This is kind of our version of a land acknowledgement, which is something that we'll continue to do as we move forward in this webinar series. So a couple things before we get started, housekeeping notes, if you will. In addition to having these be an authentic and expert-led experience, which you're going to get with Sally, Roxanne, and Lucas, we also aim to have this be engaging. Many of you have already submitted questions for today's conversation in advance through our registration port portal, and we'll be getting to many of those today. Uh, if you have a question that you would like to ask Roxanne or Sally while in this, at the bottom of the screen, in the lower, lower end of the screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. That is the appropriate place to ask your question. Know that we're going to be taking these advanced questions first and that we'll get to some of those Q and A's that you asked during this webinar a little bit later. It is entirely possible with the number of attendees and the number of questions that have been asked that we won't get to everything today, uh, but we, we will try to follow up with you or you're always welcome to reach out to us if you have questions about visiting the monument. Also, I wanna note that this webinar is being recorded for potential use later. So let's start to jump into this conversation about leadership and the creation of Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, as well as the intersections of private industry, philanthropy, and the greater good. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. We have Roxanne Quimby, who is a co-founder of Burt's Bees Personal Care Products in 1984 and built the company into what we know it as today. During and after her time with Burt's Bees, she acquired parcels of forested land that she eventually donated to the federal government to create Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. Sally Jewell served as U.S. Secretary of Interior under President Obama from 2013 to 2017, working with Roxanne and Lucas to create new public lands in the North Main Woods. Prior to that, she served as CEO of the outdoor retailer REI. And our moderator for this, this afternoon is Lucas St. Clair. He is the president of Elliottsville Foundation, an organization that serves at the nexus of outdoor recreation, conservation, and economic revitalization. He is also Roxanne's son. He worked on the local, state, and federal levels to fulfill his mother's vision for this park. And he's also a member of the board of directors 
of Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Lucas, for, to lead this conversation. Thank you, Andy. Thank, that's a great introduction. And um, I'm so super excited to be with all of you today. This is a, a mark on my calendar that I've been looking forward to for a long time. And to have a conversation with two conservation leaders, uh, one that I know super, super well, and one that I'm really proud to call a friend and have known for a while. And we share a lot of common geographies and it's, it's a really fun opportunity for me. So thank you for joining and, uh, and thanks for the opportunity. So I, I, what I'm curious really to get at today is just, you know, how has your connection to nature inspired and informed your professional lives and the work that you've done? You both have achieved so much in, in your lives. And I want to start by asking, I'll start with you, Sally, just your, when, do, you, do you have a moment when you first remember being kind of in awe by nature, struck by nature, and then how has that, in, and if it has, how has that informed your work uh, throughout the years? And, and when you're done, then mom, you can just jump right in and, and answer that as well. Yeah, well, um, I'm a nature kid and I have been for as long as I can remember. I'm an immigrant from the UK and uh, came to the Seattle area when I was three years old. My dad came about uh, six months before his young family. My uh, youngest brother at the time was just six weeks old when my mom packed up me at three, my sister at four, and uh, my brother Jim at six weeks and brought us across many flights to, uh, to the US. And my dad asked his colleagues at work what people did here. And they said, well, you camp and you hike and you join this little co-op called REI, which was on the second floor above the green apple pie market in uh, downtown Seattle at the time. And from that point forward, that's what we did. So my dad grew up sailing, but in England, you know, they don't have the public lands and nature like we have in the Seattle area. And I remember as a child, um, just there were so many huge trees, trees you could hold hands with your friends that would, uh, you know, might take 20 of you to encircle. And over time, those trees went away, um, except in pockets like Olympic National Park or Mount Rainier National Park, or later on um, North Cascades National Park. So, you know, those early memories of just incredibly large trees and rich, you know, marine life in uh, Puget Sound. And how that has diminished over time, I would say really led me to conservation. But it was a chapter in my career when I was a banker and I got to work with um, a giant, civic giant in our region called Jim Ellis on something called the Mountains to Sound Greenway that I really got to know what conservation was all about. And it was, I was basically looking at the areas that I grew up playing in as a child that had been developed. You know, the woods, the sort of jungle we called it out behind our house was now um, lots of multifamily housing. Uh, and so you see things being nibbled away and you realize that a ribbon of asphalt, I-90, is going to just draw that development, and is there a way to be smart about it? And that's what got me involved in conservation. And I was 34, and Jim, who became a mentor, who just died last November, was 68 at the time. And I learned at his knee, and there's probably no more important experience I had than the Greenway that, that prepared me for, uh, you know, for what I ended up doing later in career. So um, yeah, deep engagement with nature and deep commitment to how we get children to have those experiences that uh, I enjoyed but are not accessible to many, many people within this country. Indeed. <laughs> well, I, my background is in the arts. I decided I wanted to be an artist when I was five and I pursued uh, artistic education at San Francisco Art Institute. And I must admit, that for me, landscapes are about the beauty. Um, I, I, I'm not much of a scientist and um, I guess I don't really understand the nuances of conservation, but I'm just enthralled by a beautiful landscape. And for me, that's about a natural landscape. And 
I feel like the way to, for me personally, the way to preserve those landscapes was to buy them. And that gives you a great deal of influence over how they're used. And that would prevent the development of these landscapes into man-made um, development, which usually uh, didn't help. <laughs> help the landscape. So I guess that that's what it was for me. Um, my first experience of a natural sort that my family went on was a walk in the woods where we, the four of us, we each had one quarter of the volumes of the um, Encyclopedia Britannica as we walked through the woods identifying flowers and plants, uh, which was arduous and uh, I guess that was my first experience and one of my last ones with nature. Um, but just to sum it up, I guess it, it is all about the beauty of the landscape for me and the inspiration that that beauty um, holds for me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's, uh, I remember those big trees uh, very well in the Pacific Northwest. It's, they're truly, truly outstanding. So uh, both both of you have grown and been at the helm of big businesses here in, in, in the U.S., Sally at REI and, and Mom at Bird's Bees. And while perhaps it's a little bit more obvious why REI would, would be motivated to, to connect with open space and public lands and, and conservation in general, I mean, it's not quite so obvious with Bird's Bees, but it clearly was a major um, sort of lens in which you both looked through as you made decisions around business. And I'm curious to know uh, how, how and why that was so important, why that lens was perhaps one of the very first ones you looked through after the fiduciary responsibility to the company, or maybe even before the fiduciary responsibility. And mom, if you would take that first question and how you were motivated by nature. Um, well, I think it, it should be mentioned that uh, the company that Sally was running had a very unusual and unique um, business organization and structure, which I thought was very progressive. And I must admit that Burt's Bees was run like a ruthless bunch of capitalists. <laughs> and we were terrible. You know, we did have certain rules about ingredients and packaging and living wage. Um, but we were in hot pursuit of profit. And it started to accumulate. Personal care industry happens to be quite a uh, lucrative uh, niche. And the, uh, the funds started accumulating as a result of this uh, ambition. And that's when we looked to see, well, what do we do with this money? Um, and it just seemed the most priceless, the most priceless uh, thing that we could possibly do would be to buy things that we thought were priceless. So um, I thought land was priceless, even though there was a market value. It was something that no human being could possibly create. And that just made it beyond the um, monetary value. So um, I felt like that was a good investment since I didn't know about stocks and bonds and wasn't particularly interested in them. But I was looking into something that was just a rock solid um, investment. And, and that's what, what we came up with was land and, the, and preserving it. No, Roxanne, I think you sell yourself short. I mean, Burt's Bees was way ahead of its time for using natural products and showing how you could have something like personal care products that actually were created in harmony with nature. So um, certainly those of us on the outside don't view you or Burt's Bees as a, uh, a driven <laughs> capitalist, even though that might have been the result. <laughs> Well, that's why we put the bearded hippie out front, you know, it's like <laughs> behind him were a bunch of money grubbing capitalists. Uh, what we, but we always did adhere to very sound. We thought the industry 
um, needed uh, reform in terms of packaging. Nobody was thinking about all those in packaging that the goop goes into. And it needed the reform on the identification of what it is to be a female. Because a lot of this industry is just wrapped around the exploitation of women's insecurities about the way they look, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted, that's one of the reasons we put Bird out there. Um, you know, he obviously was not, not in the running <laughs> um, for the beauty contest. And so with those two things in mind and, you know, purity of ingredients, there were three sort of simple rules. You know, it did, it did end up crafting a business that was, um, um, you know, contemporary in its, in its value system and hopefully a role model um, as well. But I'm, I must say, I was just dr a driven businesswoman. I, you know, I just couldn't stop. Lucas will testify 24 seven and I'd drag them in on summer vacations to wrap soap. <laughs> Poor Lucas and Hannah got roped into it. Well, you did an amazing job. And, well, thank you. Uh, it was a, a run. <laughs> the early days of REI, which was founded by the Anderson family, um, and I've been in touch that, that Mary Anderson died at 107. She was REI member number two, and Lloyd Anderson died in 2000 at age 98. So nature in the outdoors is good for you, but it was rough on their kids. Um, so co-op was founded in 1938. And I look at those beginnings and where, you know, it can be viewed as a great operational model as a co-op. It's difficult uh, to have a member-owned organization. And when you look at it, there were lots of personal sacrifices that the Anderson family made, including in their capital and Lloyd working two jobs and Mary sewing tents and their house being the distribution center that uh, make it a little bit difficult to replicate. But, you know, in spite of the nice things you've said about REI and its structure, when I got there as a board member in 1996, and then as chief operating officer in 2000, and then later CEO, I realized that, you know, we were spending some of our um, profits in protecting places, but we weren't engaging in the way that we needed to. We were taking public lands for granted. And I think, as I mentioned, the, the Greenway and kind of the development along I-90 and how do you be smart about that? Uh, and it was that actually that led me to the board of REI and so on. That was the connection. Is that um, REI had a responsibility to actually engage, engage in the political process, in the advocacy. And more importantly, there were a lot of organizations doing land preservation, but few that were working on engaging people in stewardship. And I think about like, like the young people from the CCC in the 1930s, the young men, they were all men, five million of them, um, who were put to work on public lands and building places that we all take for granted all over the country, from Shenandoah National Park to Mount Rainier, actually. Um, and they, the outdoors never left them. And that sense of stewardship and connection to place and nature was with them for their, their whole lives. And I thought, how can REI engage more people in environmental stewardship? And so, you know, that's where we took the direction of the co-op is you had to have enough money to support growth and to pay members a dividend, which I know my, last year I was there was $110 million and it's now like 150 million that goes to members, but much more now is going into engaging underrepresented communities, supporting their connection to nature, and building that base of support from the bottom up so that everybody can have a chance to enjoy Katahdin Woods and Waters because they've had a local park and an area that's been preserved and nature in their own backyards to the extent that that's possible. And, um, you know, it's, it, I'll tell you, for our employees at REI, there were 10,000 when I left. Um, I think it's gotten up to something like 12, although it's been a rough year for retail. Um, but their enjoyment in the jobs at REI increased because of the work we were doing in environmental stewardship and the way we were engaging with communities. And that's, you know, kind of golden where you're you're doing well in business, but you're giving back and you're creating customers of the future and they reflect more of the population of the US than what you'd had before. So 
I'd say, uh, you know, that's how uh, nature and conservation influenced um, the way I engaged as a business person. That's great. Yeah. I'm so it's it's so important for outdoor recreation companies to engage in, and I think REI has done a great job sort of setting that standard. Um, we, we're having a wonderful partnership with L.L. Bean here and I remember you, you, you talking to me about L.L. Bean back in 2016 and saying, you know, they really should get in, involved with the work that you're doing and they certainly have and uh, so I appreciate the, the guidance that you provided there. So I was thinking about this this morning, Sally, when we, um, I think mom and I had lunch with you in the White House in right around when the monument was about to happen. And you were talking about the vetting process for, for you as you were getting the job. And you were saying that, you know, your, your relatives, next door neighbors were getting calls about you. And, you know, they were running all the, you know, doing all the background checks about the job and what that meant. And that must have put something in your mind of just about sort of the, the, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, the, the unknown knowns or the known unknowns, it just this job is going to be hard. And there are going to be a bunch of things that are going to be incredibly challenging. And you probably thought about very specifically what those challenges would be and, and how you wanted to navigate them or try to come to some resolution with them. Uh, and so what, what were those things? And then were those the things that actually turned out to be the challenges once once you got the job and got got into it? Well, to say I was naive coming from business and going into a big government job would be an understatement. You know, one of the most interesting things that well, you know, when you go through the vetting process, I mean, I think the FBI probably personally interviewed 50 people from my past, including bosses that I'd had in the 1970s. Uh, ah. My neighbors at a little beach property that I have, not to mention my neighbors in my home community of Seattle. But um, I would also say that, you know, I mean, the Department of Interior is large. And one of the biggest challenges, people said, you can't trust anybody in Washington, D.C. You need to bring your own team. And I said, I have a great team. And we know a lot about selling backpacks. But my team doesn't know anything about government. And... So I need, I mean, fortunately, I was President Obama's second Secretary of the Interior. Ken Salazar had gone in as a politician with uh, a better background for politics than I had, and he had a team. So I had people I could rely upon. But I was told by many people, you can't trust anybody here. And that's not true. But I will say the knives in Washington, D.C. are sharp. And the thing that was hardest and most challenging is that you are immediately thrust into the spotlight and everything that you say can and will be used against you if possible. And I've never been in a situation where, you know, I walk out of a hearing room and all of a sudden there's like 50 microphones in my face and all kinds of questions coming at me. So, uh, you know, it, REI didn't prepare me well for that. As Roxanne knows, when you're running a business, you know, you've got position power, people understand business, the rules are really clear, you've got a scorecard. In government, you're serving the public. And the public's like from the farthest of the far right to the farthest of the far left and all points in between. And serving the public is much harder than um, operating a business. And uh, so I did not have an appreciation for that. It was a huge challenge. But it's not to say that there weren't a lot of lessons in business about creating a great place to work for employees that was um, you know, true across the board. So uh, it was a steep learning curve. And uh, you know, I stepped in it a few times, but uh, nothing too serious <laughs> that um, I wasn't able to recover from. Sally, I heard that you were insisting on driving your Prius instead of the government black limos. Is that well, true? Kind of. Um, well, first I said, look, I, I had no security detail while I was a nominee and I was walking back and forth to the interior where I was hiding out in an office because you're not allowed to have anything more than public information while you're going through confirmation. And sometimes at 11 o'clock at night, you know, walking by myself. And now all of a sudden I need to have a security detail. I said, well, I'm getting used to walking. Can I just walk? And they said, well, you could, but we'd have to follow you in the car. And I said, well, that's not practical. I'll slow down traffic. So, you know, we had two large vehicles 
what we call a fed sled, which is the um, classic black suburban. And then they, they also had like a hybrid Tahoe, but it was huge. And I said, you know, unless we're taking a lot of people, let's get a, an energy efficient car. So, you know, we want an American made. So we got a Ford Focus hybrid, <laughs> which All right. it's fair to say my security detail was not very fond of. Um, and it was a little more cramped in the back seat, which is where I always got to ride. But we did pull up at the president's climate action plan speech at Georgetown University in June of, of 2013. And there were protesters there with signs where the dignitaries were pulling up. And when I pulled up in the black with lights, Ford Focus Hybrid, they started to clap. So All right. people notice, right? Yeah, totally. And, and why should you be burning so much fuel just driving around Washington, D.C.? You know, how often is it that you're going to need to, like, push a car out of the way? So, anyway, yes. <laughs> well, I it thought was, it was admirable. You walked the talk. Well, the team yeah. was cooperative. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sally, you mentioned um, your sort of the immigrant story that you have. And um, so I'd be curious to hear sort of how that connected you to um, the uniqueness of, of the United States and, and how it relates to, to recreation, conservation, public lands. You know, the U.S. is really unique in that the best places here are reserved for the American public, everyone. And you think about, you know, the grandeur of the Grand Canyon or, you know, the history that we recognize painful and proud in battlefield sites and, you know, historical sites where bad things happened as well as good things happening. In the country I came from, the UK, pretty class oriented society. That's one of the reasons my parents left, but also a place where the best lands oftentimes are controlled by the crown. So it's very different. And uh, so, you know, we are unique in the United States with these assets that we have and, you know, the, the crown jewels of those public lands really are recognized um, through, through national parks and the national park system. But, you know, kind of in line with that, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to, I mean, I've known Roxanne for over a decade now. We didn't know each other well, but the first time I met her, um, she was talking about the importance of the North Woods of Maine and how she felt that, you know, they were worthy of being a national park. And this was when I was on the board of the National Parks Conservation Association. And, you know, whether it was that or another angle or another angle, there was Roxanne talking about the North Woods of Maine, talking about, you know, the value of Acadia in Maine and how, you know, the state boasted incredible natural resources uh, and history that was worthy of protection. So I'd like to turn that back to Roxanne and say, you know, what motivated you to, to really just work so hard and invest so much time and treasure and some sharp knives, I think, in the process as, as people questioned your motivations? What motivated you to, to accumulate the land adjacent to Baxter State Park that became Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument? Well, I had some great neighbors, uh, Percival Baxter and the Rockefellers having created uh, public land in Maine. I lived just a couple miles away from the uh, launching point of the 100 Mile Wilderness, which is part of the Appalachian Trail and the last 100 miles before you get to Katahdin, which was a very well-known, huge state park created through a family, uh, mainly Percival Baxter and, and his family. I had read about Acadia and how that was a, that uh, Mount Desert Island, how it was created. And, um, and the idea I felt was very um, inspiring that, you know, and they did it, they did it. You know, it wasn't just a vision that may or may not happen, but here were two very concrete examples within you know, my community practically where it had been done. And it had been done with difficulty. There were challenges. 
Um, in both cases, the land was purchased um, by the founder um, with some opposition. And so it was, it was nice to know that, I, you know, that this is kind of a routine thing, um, at least in Maine, but many national parks and parks in general are created with philanthropic dollars and are not greeted with um, overwhelming joy and hospitality at first until they become the most important thing in the neighborhood. Um, so that was reassuring to know that people who had come before me who were doing a similar kind of, of activity were um, also met with a great deal of challenge at the beginning. Um, and I felt the lands that became Katahdin Woods and Waters being adjacent to Baxter State Park um, made them more important because it continued this, the habitat of the natural world that was being preserved at Baxter. So I had read that Baxter actually wanted the lands to the east of the East Branch, but you know he had kind of done his thing, and, um, but his vision was for that land to continue all the way out to the East Branch. And so kind of did what he had hoped to do, um, and it was reassuring to me that um, he would have approved of the forest and its inhabitants being um, preserved like they are at Baxter. And the other motivation I would say was economic because living in a town here in uh, Winter Harbor that has a unit of the national park system in it, I see the economic benefits of the campgrounds and the kayak rentals and the bike rentals and the people who um, you know buy food. It's it's a it's a great economic engine. And this particular town lost its navy base and um, was hurting for quite a while. And the navy base reverted to the National Park Service. It became a unit of the National Park. It was an expansion of of a small unit of a national park here. And the last year or the year before, a philanthropist funded a campsite, a hundred, a hundred uh, space campsite, so people had a place to spend the night. Um, and they, they now spend a few nights here. There was no really overnight accommodations for people in this town, tourists, so they would leave quickly or at least after you know the afternoon. So now they're spending more time, they're spending more money. And I, you know, the business person in me um, craves um, economic growth, um, not to a deleterious effect, but um, this, this town needed uh, some outside money coming in and, and, the, and, and the same uh, with the uh, Katahdin region. They had lost a lot of their economic activity when the mills closed and they needed, they needed uh, something to keep them going. And um, the national parks have proven over and over and over again in rural areas to be economic engines. So that appealed to me a great deal as well. You know, Roxanne, you mentioned before the immigration story of your family also shaping your interest in giving back. I think I think folks here would love to hear a little bit about that. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm the first American, <laughs> I'm the first uh, person on my um, mother's side of the family to be born in the United States after they had immigrated here about a year. So I think they, they left um, right during the um, communist revolution in China and landed in Massachusetts and a year later I was born but um, you know my my grandparents suffered at the hands of religious intolerances including some of the family members being murdered for their faith or the way they chose to to uh, pray and um, my grandfather happened to escape with his life and um, went to Shanghai, China, which was an open port. You didn't need a passport. And he was able, he was 19 and he ended up in uh, Shanghai. And my grandmother, she ran away from Siberia with her family and for the same reasons of religious persecution. 
and liquidated everything they owned. My grandfather, my grandmother's father had a little bakery and, um, you know, it was all just disappeared. And they also went to Shanghai and met each other, my grandmother and grandfather, and they had three children, um, my mother being the oldest. And then the communist revolution occurred and all the uh, white foreigners, which included my grandparents, had to leave. And I th they just couldn't believe they had to leave again, you know, for some kind of political situation that was beyond their um, ability to control. But um, eventually it became clear that they did have to leave. Um, my grandmother said they took the second to the last boat out of China. And um, all the while, um, they dreamt of the United States as offering a refuge from this running away for one's beliefs. And that we would be welcome here and comforted here. We would never be persecuted for our religion or, or our politics. And the United States was part of our family's um, folklore. And I, my mother told me the story, must have made a big impression on me because I remember it. Um, she was told before she got to America that there was gold on the streets. And she said when she first got here, she was always looking for that gold on the streets. But it was a, a symbol of, of the prosperity and the abundance that this country and its democracy offered to immigrants. My grandparents at the age of 50 opened up a hot dog stand on Revere Beach in uh, right outside of Boston and sold hot dogs and french fries from early morning until 11 o'clock at night. And I watched that, how they supported, they sent one of their daughters to music school and another one to Boston University. And I saw this passion and the ability to work so hard um, because they finally had come to what they believed would, it was um, a, a great democracy. And I was inspired by that. I, I really, you know, being kind of a hippie and sort of a communist in a way, you know, um, or at least believing in communal values, um, it, it appealed to me that public lands were not owned by anyone or they were otherwise owned by everyone. And to me, that was uh, a very communal way of expressing the best features of, of our democracy. And that's how I got um, interested in the designation of a, of a um, national monument. Inspiring. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I, for one, am really glad that the United States welcomed both of our families into the so yeah. welcoming. Yeah, it's, uh, it really is a great story. Um, so I, I, I want to segue a little bit. We've just got some incredible questions that f folks are answering. And one just popped up that um, I also am very curious about for, for Sally is when you were in the interior, when did you first think, oh, that National Monument in Maine might happen? It was the consistent tenacity of Roxanne. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I knew about it before I became Secretary of the Interior. And again, it's it's Roxanne's tenacity and a whole lot of hard work. Um, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of people that would like national monument designations for places that are special to them. And one of the jobs as Secretary of the Interior is to figure out um, does it warrant the brand of the National Park Service probably arguably no better brand of the federal government to be associated with than the arrowhead of the National Park Service. And Roxanne knew that. She understood branding because Burt's Bees is a strong brand as is REI. And um, so, you know, that's tricky. And I would say that I wasn't a pushover and neither was my team that we needed to really understand what was there. And to be honest with you, as has happened in many of the national monuments, a lot of which have later become national parks, there are treasures there that we don't fully understand at the, at the time a place is designated. I think it, one of the uh, things that our team at the Park Service um, really understood was that 
the Wabanaki people and the way they use the lands uh, since time immemorial, which, you know, in terms of occupying those lands would have been basically the retreat of the ice 12 to 20,000 years ago. There's so much more to be understood and discovered about those cultures. This is a place where um, you see evidence of the supercontinent Pangaea and incredible geology that also, you know, ex extends through to the uplifting of the Appalachian Mountains and then the erosion and uh, the Ice Age and so on. There's a lot to be learned, but these are things that the Park Service worked hard to understand um, and to document. And I just encourage people to read the proclamation that President Obama signed uh, when it was designated to just get a sense of how much more is there in Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument than what you might know. Because most of us as, as consumers of public lands come there for what Roxanne talked about, you know, kind of the artistic inspiration, the natural beauty, maybe the opportunity to exercise and um, uh, get a dose of nature, to walk in the forest, to, you know, paddle down the east branch of the Penobscot River like I did, being guided by a, a very uh, skillful canoeist in Lucas St. Clair. Um, these are things that make this a place that's worthy of National Monument designation. And, uh, but I was not a pushover, even though Roxanne had been uh, making the case uh, to me in different venues and many other people, um, we had to make sure that we, uh, we verified that the assets that, um, that they were talking about were really special enough to warrant National Monument designation. And uh, so, uh, that's the background and, and um, it's there. It's, uh, there's a lot to be protected and I, I think the friends of Katahdin Wood and Wa Woods and Waters National Monument, which is who's hosting this event, are going to be really, really important in sharing with the public what's there and frankly in continuing to do the research that the Park Service may not have the money for um, to know what's there so we don't inadvertently um, overuse those resources or destroy those resources um, that we understand it and we guide the visitor experience so that they stay there unimpaired for future generations. That's yeah. exactly right. I'd like to put in a commercial interruption for the friends um, groups. Um, as a board member of the National Park Foundation, I learned how important it was for the friends groups who uh, sort of adopt a park and and um, support a lot of the activities that the Park Service can't, can't execute on specifically. Um, and they do a wonderful job. I know the Friends of Acadia in, uh, in Maine is a very strong and uh, group that advocates for the park and has set up all kinds of infrastructure um, solutions uh, that the Park Service may, may or may not have been able to afford. So our friends group at Katahdin Woods and Waters, uh, um, you know, it, it's, I think it's sort of like adopting a puppy, you know, they're all really cute, but like, who's going to, that I think, you know, the, the National Park Service is, is uh, it's got 400 puppies that it is, all, they're all competing for um, uh, the budget to uh, improve, repair, maintain, these public lands, which are, it's not, a, it's not an in, inexpensive thing to do. Um, so we feel like the Katahdin Woods and Waters Friends um, group can, can give that extra boost of support to the monument that may not be affordable to the actual National Park Service at this time. So I think that was a really great, great um, point that you brought up, Sally, how important those friends groups are um, and how you can support your parks and your public lands by joining them. And they're a lot of fun too, doing trail work and, and um, all kinds of activities. That's it's my idea. Because the National Park Service employees who are chronically underfunded, although we did just see passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, which is waiting for President Trump's signature, which is terrific, and, and we'll put money into facilities and so on that have been uh, uh, underfunded for a long time, but advocacy makes a difference. And 
you know, calling those members of Congress, which a National Park Service employee cannot do. Uh, I don't know what the total number of employees at Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument is, but I'm guessing it's pretty small still. And uh, the friends groups can help make the case for, for why additional support is needed. And I also want to say, Roxanne referenced this uh, private donation of a campground um, in Acadia National Park that's built to National Park standards, but it was built before it was donated. I just have to say a big thanks to Roxanne for also putting in money and, um, and support for roads, facilities, um, visitor contact, and so on. Um, that can be done privately and uh, save more money than what would be the case if it was uh, done under federal contracting rules. So Roxanne, your, your business acumen uh, flowed all the way through to how this monument was designated and how we can be smart and efficient in the use of money uh, to, uh, to get it up and operational so that the visitor experience over time will be what it should be to share the treasures of, of Katahdin. I'm one of those national park visitors that never gets more than 100 feet from my car. So I like to have a good road. <laughs> <laughs> a place to park <laughs> um, pretty bad that way but uh, it's it is true um, especially with this big old forest you know how do you access it um, if you if you're a visitor or you've never been to Maine or you've never been to the North Woods of Maine it's like well what are, <laughs> what am I supposed to do now looks like a big green ocean so um, you know hiking trails and um, you know uh, that that seems incredibly important for people to use it. I like having so, the campground here here at Acadia. It brings in a very interesting group of people. We just got a question about the um, dark sky designation, and this is one of my favorite, very short stories. Um, after your time as secretary, the following secretary um, was reviewing some of the national monuments to see whether they were worthy of remaining in the National Park Service and uh, wh whether or not that monument designation works. So um, Secretary Zinke came to the Katahdin region and he and I were uh, canoeing down the river and he said, you know, I think there was some overreach with the proclamation. Um, you know, the designation of, of the, uh, or in the proclamation, it says that one of the interests or special interests of the monument is the, the dark sky. Like, don't you think jurisdiction over the dark sky? I mean, that, that come on. Like, is that, don't you think that's a bit of overreach? So then fast forward to that night, we're sitting around a campfire and uh, his communications person got up to use the outhouse and came back in and said, you know, I've never seen stars like this in my life. These are amazing. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know. Uh, and then just uh, a, few, a few months ago, um, we received a dark sky designation from the International Dark Sky Association. So a question was, uh, how do you feel about that? And it was directed to you, Mom. Or, um, is it validating, I think, is what the question was. Oh, absolutely. I love looking at those <coughs> maps of the United States electrified at night. You know, all, you see all the lights, and there's that big black hole there in the middle of Maine, you know, where Baxter and the monument, and it's like, oh, relief, relief from all the bright lights that um, you know, outshine the natural features of the night sky. And my theory has always been that looking up at the night sky is a humbling experience and one which all humans need to observe at least a couple times a week, to feel that small. And, you know, you don't, I think it's really important to develop that humility and, and, there's no quicker way to do it than looking up at a dark sky and, and feeling like you are just the tiniest little speck in the universe. So those night skies are, to me, they're very important just for our evolutionary values and keeping in touch with um, the fact that we're really not in charge, even though we think we are. We probably there also, and getting that designation as an international dark sky is actually really helpful in, in pushing back against um, development that can Im impede that. And we've seen that in other sites, for example, in North Dakota with venting and flaring of oil and gas wells uh, uh, close to Theodore Roosevelt 
National Park, um, which does impact that night sky. So it will give the Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters, as well as the National Park Service, more fodder for making sure that as development might occur, and one hopes it does from an economic standpoint, that it's done in a way that doesn't impact that. And it, and it can be done. Lights can be focused down. They can be less bright um, so that that incredible feature, which is pretty hard to get on the eastern seaboard of the United States, um, can, can remain unimpaired. Mm -hmm. Well, there's um, there's a, just a few questions in the in the Q and A, but there are a ton of question or of comments, and um, the comments both are uh, to you, Sally. You are missed at the Department of Interior. Many, <laughs> many, many people um, <laughs> miss you a lot, and thank you for all your good work. And mom, a lot of people have said just how inspiring your story is, and. The gift to the American public is is just so incredibly generous, and and I, I certainly agree. And I know there are a, a, a lot of people joining us today, and a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to. But um, I, for one, have had a great time hearing the two of you uh, in conversation. It's 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 really been great to have you in the same virtual room again. It's been a long time. Um, and I know we're we're coming to an end. So uh, if if either of you have closing thoughts before Andy Andy jumps in and and closes this out, please. Uh, maybe Sal, if you wanna if you have anything to close with, that'd be great. Sure. Well, let me just say a profound thanks to you, Roxanne, for this contribution, and to you, Lucas, for your engagement with the community. You know, I mentioned earlier that running a business is easy compared to, um, to, to operating in government. And it's because serving the public means listening to different points of view and taking those into account and, and shaping something that um, really does reflect some compromise, but also you know, an opening of the eyes to the way we all view things through a different lens. And I think Roxanne, you had this big vision, and Lucas, you listened to concerns in the community. And one of the things that's really um, unique to Katahdin Woods and Waters is some of the ways you've accommodated historical uses, like snow machines, which generally are, you know, they're highly restricted if they're allowed at all in national park sites, and also hunting in specific areas, but recognizing that it's timber companies that sold the lands to Roxanne to begin with because the economics that had driven the region in the past were different than the economics of today. So you have given a gift to the American people that will continue to give in the generations forward. And one of the things that I used as a North Star as Secretary of the Interior is we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. So you have done something thinking about the future of everyone's children and how you can make it better for them, how you can hand them something uh, that they can be proud of and can take forward. And uh, no one can take that away because of uh, the national park designation and the donation of these lands, which are now in the hands of, of all Americans and people from all backgrounds. So profound thank you to both of you. And also a thank you to those who have joined the Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters, of which I am a member as well. And in fact, I think I have my, my waterproof trail map right here. I'm just, you know, 3,500 miles away. That's the only downside. <laughs> it's no ability to fly right now, but um, enjoy this place. Take care of this place. Support the people of the National Park Service who are under-resourced and uh, usually hear everybody's complaints, but don't get to, uh, enough thanks for the hard work that they do. So they're your partners in this. And um, I hope you work closely with them in order to, uh, to unlock the mysteries and uh, the treasures of Katahdin Woods and Waters. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sally. Mom, do you have anything you want to close with before Andy leads us out? Well, I think that, you know, coming from the business background, I always believed that whoever was writing the checks was the one in charge. And this was, this was a lesson that, that uh, as you say, working with the public, serving the public, and being in a position where listening to all the points of view 
was absolutely shocking to me. It's like, no, wait a minute. I wrote the check. <laughs> so that's where Lucas came in. And um, Lucas really healed a lot of the wounds that I inadvertently created with my checkbook. <laughs> and um, listen to the community, as you mentioned, was so important, Sally. Um, he really did listen and compromised. And um, I think that both of you could easily have upended the whole project. So you were both absolutely essential um, to making it happen, as was President Obama. Um, and for that, I'm very grateful and, and humbled. And I wish to thank you, Sally, and and your boss at that time, and Lucas, who did a lot of quarterbacking in this football game. So thank you both. Great. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna turn it over to Andy to, to close us out. And I just wanna thank, before we do, thank, thank you both. This has been a real joy. And I'm gonna just pile on. Lucas, Sally, Roxanne, thank you so much for being not only part of this community, but helping create this community and this inspiration. Um, uh, there's many of us uh, that have just been inspired and we hope to continue to grow this community that supports our public lands, our natural places, and um, the wonder and beauty that they bestow. Um, I won't pitch membership because it's already been pitched plenty, but you can find us and more information about us at friends of Katahdin, uh, friendsofkww.org. We're also on Facebook and on Instagram if you'd like to find us there and follow us. Um, and uh, I do want to answer one question. I did not see the comet uh, while I was in the monument. Uh, either the clouds or those pesky mountains that are just to the west of, of Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument uh, made it a little challenging. But I, if you do get out there and see it, please send me an email of a picture of it. I would love to see it for myself, and there's still a little bit of time left. So please stay tuned, everyone, for more of these conversations that will be coming up in the future. Um, and we hope that you can, when it's safe to do so, Sally, to get in an airplane or uh, drive across country, we do hope that you'll pay this place a visit, um, of course, abiding by um, a responsible recreation kind of policy. Um, but in the meantime, um, there's more resources available to experience Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument on our website. So thank you all so much for being here and I uh, hope you get out there. Thanks. <laughs>